Our, uh, in lieu of a sermon today, we have something of a round robin that will sort of explain what our process was. And to lead us off, uh, Patty is going to tell us about the, the Quechua in a video, right? Okay. Greetings. The journey of this team of repentance began like this. A suggestion came to session asking for a season of repentance to address the wrongs of the past, including racism and dispossession and conquest of our indigenous brothers and sisters. A task force was formed. We began by looking at our roots, the roots of this inclusive community of faith planted by Don Allen and the deeper roots of the land our house church stands on that you'll hear about soon. So, repentance, remorse, regret, sorrow, repent. A change of mind accompanied by heartfelt regret over a former way of life, wrong actions, or what one has failed to do. Genuine repentance produces change and action. An about face. Turn away from self to God. Breathe. Ah, <sighs> how do we begin to repent? Planet Word is an interactive museum of words in DC that gave us an idea. Listen to the founder, Anne Friedman. I want people to be aware of their words aware of words that people use around them, and aware of the ones that they use themselves. Because they have a choice. You can use words to hurt others, to wound, or you can use them to heal and to create. Friendships and understanding and empathy. And obviously it's important to me that you use your words to do the latter. I had someone come up to me, not knowing I was the founder, who was from Peru. He spoke Quechua, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, thank you for having Quechua in the museum, because he felt recognized, and like his heritage, is important enough to make it into this museum. That really meant a lot to me. Also, if you listen to the Quechua ambassador, she's my favorite, She's an elderly woman, and she talks about how in Quechua, the future is behind you because you can't see it, and the past is ahead of you because you've seen it. So it's the opposite in English, where we say the future is ahead of us and the past is behind us. And so I want people to see that how we do things in English or America or with words is just one way. There are all sorts of interesting options that open up a world to you. Then a light bulb went off for us. We must look to our past that is in plain sight ahead of us and perhaps weighing us down. We change having newly seen, heard, and touched the past. We turn and look to God and the future behind us. Now listen to our story. Brick by brick, we dismantle. Brick by brick, we build. Pretty soon I want to get to a lengthy business of thanking everyone. Indeed, I want to transgress against a norm and name some names. I want to do that because the sheer number of names involved in our process is impressive by itself. What we are about, no one else can do alone. No, it requires a gathering, a cloud of witness, a burgeoning caravan of pilgrims to which we invite you. Let me begin by thanking Patty for bringing that brilliant insight of the Quechua uh, into how we live in relation to our past. 
Wisdom like that, its usefulness, will depend on our time and place, of course. One of the truths of time is that we cannot stop it. Change will come. The question is whether we can sway that change into something resembling progress. Whether as Christians we are living into the commandment to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and give refuge to the victims of war. The Quechua conception of the future reminds us that we cannot actually see where we are going. And when you live and work among the precipices, precipices of the Andean highlands, walking backwards can be a very dangerous activity. Yet some can do this gracefully. I'm sure you've all heard the one about Ginger Rogers, right? Able to do everything Fred Astaire could do only backwards and in high heels. I practiced that at home and left my high heels there. If you wanted to demonstrate it, I'd be welcome to lecture. Step by step, brick by brick, step by step, we dance. In one truly bad step, we can stumble. Fear of falling can paralyze, prevent us from getting anywhere at all. We cannot be controlled by that fear. Somewhere in the depths of nearly 7,000 pages of journals, I've only read 6,000 of them, Soren Kierkegaard, <laughs> I've read two of them, right? Soren Kierkegaard, a gloomy and beloved prophet of the modern Protestant tradition, said something similar. Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Kierkegaard, of course, did not live in the rural Andes. Rather, he walked through the meanders of old Copenhagen, brooding, pondering, having one really, really deep thought after another, and wandering into his own future, which was, as you know, brief. But those of most of the people around him was even briefer. The man earned his gloom. And yet, though the phrase is not his, he more than any other theologian left us the idea of the leap of faith. So get up. Stop. Don't stand still. Don't shuffle. Don't tiptoe. Don't inch forward only to lurch back. Get up and leap. You see where this is going? You're already walking backward on a high Andean pass, and uh, what could possibly go wrong if you jumped? Kierkegaard also walked ceaselessly. One would think compulsively, aimlessly, encountering all the variety that the city provided. From within his burdens, very heavy burdens, he greeted each person equally as a child of God. Profoundly, he did not distinguish between the gutter drunkard and the wealthy merchant between the harlot and the lady, or the heretic and the pious kirkamand, the laughing infant, or the downcast geriatric. In the midst of suffering and loss in the worst of climates, we are human, and faith in our shared humanity connects us to God. If you walk in that spirit, you are going the right way. It is not sight, but insight that we need. We are, first of all, grateful to the folks in the AV room. Can't hear them clapping for themselves. <laughs> Who are coping with our more than usually complex and last minute needs. And we thank you for the several who made today's service possible by sorting through a tangle of permissions and copyrights. You guys are super competent. Oddly, I'm also grateful for the incompetence incompetence of the roofers who poorly tarped their work that night two years ago when there was a big wind and the deluge of Easter 2020. Without that misstep, the wall would never have been revealed. It would still be a bland wallboard concealing the past. The benefits of some mistakes can be large. As we ponder how we come to this moment of clarity, I'm, I've got to take a deep breath before I say this part. <clears throat> We can thank my daughter, Hannah. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> Who, before her move to Vancouver, prodded us to include in our statement of identity a recognition that we reside here on what was once indigenous land. Thank you, love. I admire your conscience and your gumption, and you didn't get it from me. 
we can thank also the PCUSA for in, it, in, it, in its wisdom that the time had arrived for a season of repentance, indeed of reparation and atonement, for the deep hurts of racism and for the church's historically slow response, motivated by a desire to stay a white church to the injustices of Reconstruction. We can thank Virginia, today's pianist, for bringing the church's mandate to our attention and for helping us to remain focused on it. I'm grateful also to Pastor Stephanie and to, to Linda, and grateful to an uncanny chance that placed the three of us in the front hall after the workmen had removed the soggy wallboard. We each, without saying anything, without looking at each other, simultaneously understood that that wall could not be concealed. We had the exact same thought at the same moment. We needed to own it. We needed to touch it. Leaving today or sometime soon, please touch the wall. Let it stain your hands. Now as the Lenten season winds down, wear the brick dust with the same grief and exaltation with which you wear your ashes on Ash Wednesday. So, as in our Book of Orderly Way, we had a task force. Committee work, oh, girl. <laughs> Think again. We were all impressed with how rewarding this was and how much we personally gained from the parts we played in coming to this place in this moment. Remember, we walked backwards in faith to get here. So we are grateful, pre-grateful, I guess we might say, for your openness of mind and largeness of spirit. We are standing, dancing a bit perhaps, and confident that you will not push us down and laugh at us. All of us can be grateful to Linda, whose extraordinary skills at organization are too often taken for granted. For she does so much, and willingly and well, and for her earnest embrace of the ethics of our project, which was unfailing. We are grateful to Pat, whose original uh, history of the church building gave us a sure starting point, and whose editorial aptitude was crucial in bringing our statements to say what we wanted them to say, clearly and honestly. We're grateful to Jim for plowing through documents and squinting at blurry handwriting records on the computer screen and bringing to us the unavoidable tr truth that at one point before the Civil War, that house, which is today the core of the structure in which we meet as a church, was home to a family that recorded 15 enslaved persons, the majority of them children. We're also grateful to his acumen as a builder who recognized once while working upstairs the high level of skill in the carpenter's work. The masons who built the wall were similarly skilled. There is no doubt that when it was built in the mid-1820s, that house was one of the finest and most imposing structures in the Shenandoah Valley. As we worked, we also encountered commonplaces, comfortable dismissals. For example, there's a widespread belief that in the Shenandoah, in ancient days, there was a very low population density. Indigenous people used the valley only as trade routes and for hunting. The implication was that the settlers were basically putting good use to nearly vacant land. And it's a short step from that to muttering solemnly, as God intended. There also reflected, we found reflected, the common assumption that slavery was not such a big deal in our parts. Well, sorry. And indeed, I can hardly choke this out. Enslaved people were treated like family. And besides, there weren't that many of them. Stephanie, our other one, the librarian from Bridgewater College, brought us the information that at the time of the Civil War, there were 2,800 enslaved persons in Rockingham County, representing approximately 12% of the population. By comparison, the current black population of the county is less than 2%, and of Harrisonburg, less than 8%. As a system of slavery, uh, as the system of slavery tended to moderate in Virginia, it was a poor use of the word. The plantation system was expanding and rigidifying farther south, where there was tobacco and cotton. When times were hard, 
the one or two enslaved persons were a family's most valuable and movable asset. The price they brought on average was equivalent to four years for the median income of the country, right? over $400. In the several decades before the war, some states um, in which slavery was legal were passing laws limiting the sale of enslaved children, forbidding their sale when under the age of 10. 10. In other states, they could still be sold as children. Today, in our New Testament, in our New Testament skit, yeah, sold as infants. Today, in our New Testament skit, we have been reminded that we need to be ready to wash the feet of those children. In that spirit, now and in the coming weeks, Trinity's House Church Sanctuary is taking up the cause of a refugee mother and her children whose health needs are enormous. This is what comes of walking with our eyes, turned toward the history and our own pasts, but in faith knowing we're going the right way. I also need to thank Bessie, one of our newer members, whom most of you have yet to meet, who encouraged us as we went, helping us to feel the need and inspiring the sincerity of our project. It's fundamental good. And awkward though we might appear while walking backward, the value of our effort. Brick by brick, step by blind step, building in faith, journeying toward reconciliation and justice. Brick by brick, we tear down walls that confine us. Brick by brick, we build not new barriers, but new communities. We can thank Bessie, too, for putting us in touch with Miracle Okabor, a JMU student who has recently earned a Doctor of Arts in voice. She will grace the offertory and will sing a benediction later on. We can also thank Bessie for getting my dear friend and colleague Joanne uh, to read her poem, which you're about to hear. Let it lead us further towards a future that for right now we can only see in dreams. As we face the past, lead us on. Love doesn't need a lot of space to grow. It needs this small but sacred place of decision. Let us be grateful that we belong to a community that draws us into love, hope, and justice. That we belong to God is a gift for which we all give thanks. Let our gratitude help bend the ark. Let's listen as Joanne sums up. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Bessie Mahanja and Mark Fatness for this wonderful invitation to read a poem at Trinity Presbyterian Church. As I thought about what to read, I decided on the poem, Love Doesn't Need a Lot of Space to Grow, especially as we see the devastation in Ukraine, especially as we understand the wars that are going on all around our globe. We have to make space for love. Love doesn't need a lot of space to grow. It can occupy the smallest circle of dried weeds and twigs woven by the mother bird and built among the fronds of the potted Boston fern. It is a cocoon spun of silky threads that promises winged beauty that will fly in time. It is the own sound of the earth vibrating among the rocks and the water, humming, singing, chanting life. Love doesn't need a lot of space to grow. It is a four by four vegetable garden that produces tomatoes and squash enough to feed a neighborhood. It is a three story row house filled with children and a single mom who prays her rent will be paid with canned goods, surplus cheese and pinches of hope. It is the extra place squeezed in at the table to share a meal that multiplies like the Feast of Galilee. It occupies the resolve of a father who works an extra shift week after week, month after month to take in his brother's children. 
It is the place of conviction that every child deserves a home. And every home is a trusted space for a child. Love takes up little space. It is the center of our hope for renewal and health, a bridge to the other side of sadness. It is an open door to civility and understanding where knowledge hinges who we are and what we dream. It is the arc that bends toward justice, covering those we anticipate who are not yet born. It is the distance between our imagination and our will, a holy place of decision and grace. Love doesn't need a lot of space. It takes only a place the size of our hearts to grow. Thank you all very much for this opportunity.